Hi, so my name is Maktan. Uh, I will give you I will give a talk about general decentralized decentral decision making and specifically for insurance. Okay, so firstly, before we dive into decentralized decision making, what is a decision making process? So one of the definitions given by Boyd uh, is, is referred as the OODA loop. As you can see in the OODA loop, you have four stages. You have you need to observe, you observe the, the environment, you sense it, you measure the environment. Then you orient yourself with, that, with, with respect to that environment, which means that basically you're mapping all, all space of possibilities and calculating or predicting the outcome of each um, possibility. Then you make your choice. So this is basically a skill, this is a computation, this is where your value system is. You're making a choice out of all space of possibilities, and finally you act. And then you're returning this feedback loop again and again, this is the other loop. So now with that, we want to make a, gen a generalized, decentralized decision-making system. So, what are the qualities that we would like to achieve in a decentralized decision-making system? So I would argue that there are three basic fundamental qualities we need to take care for, which are the following. Basically, you want to create maximal alignment of interest, maximal collective intelligence, and minimal cost of coordination. Let me try to explain each of them. So let's start with maximal alignment of interest. So, if you look at the economy today, at a, at a, if you want the open market, the global economy today, then we already have a pretty, pretty much decentralized collective intelligence system, right? The economy itself is very decentralized and it has a lot of collective intelligence. The problem though is that there is no mechanism for alignment of interest. So if I'm a company and I have several competitors, I have the incentive, the interest to actually damage my competitors. If I'm the oil giants, then I have the incentive to misinform the society about fossil fuels and solar energy and global warming. If I'm tobacco industry giants, then I have the incentive to misinform, disinform society about the healthiness of my product. So there is a built-in uh, element of misalignment of interest within any win-lose, zero-sum game economy. So that's, that's the problem of the economy. Um, so what we, what we mean by a maximal line of interest, we mean that basically we want to have a meritocratic system so that those who can get uh, better answers have more power to influence on the system. We want to have some sort of reputation for the clue, which means those who perform well under a certain value system get more and more reputation so that they have more power afterwards, so it's an evolving system. Then we also want to have forkability because as long as you're, if you are not aligned with the value system that you are acting at in, you, you need to have the possibility to fork to an, another value system, and then you get diversify, diversification of aligned value systems. And finally, of course, you want to reward good act. That will create basically maximum alignment of interests. Now, in an organization, for example, you have fairly well uh, alignment of interests, right? So an organization know how to create the alignment of interest. The problem there is just the opposite, okay? because it lacks collective intelligence. You can think of it as roughly the level of collective intelligence in an organization is roughly the collective intelligence of its management. So that's basically the problem. And the, and the real question is how to create something, we could call it organization, we could call it an organism, how to create something that has the attribute of an organization in terms of alignment of interest, but then has the attribute of decentralization and collective intelligence as the open market economy. So how do you make, how do you maximize collective intelligence? So the most important thing firstly is to have an open system. If, you're, if you don't have an open system, you cannot have collective intelligence coming from the edges, right? Then, you need to have the ability to have edge decision making. For example, you can have a very large organization, many, many participants, but still the, the CEO is the bottleneck to that collective intelligence. So you, you need to have people making decisions on the edges in order to basically increase collective intelligence. But then, of course, the challenge is to make it resilient. Like, how do you, on one hand, allow, it's kind of like almost 
opposite qualities, right? You want to allow decisions to make ha to happen in, in the edges, and at the same time you want to be secure from bad acting and kidnapping the system, right? So that's 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 the conundrum conundrum of of uh, decentralized decision making process. Finally, of course, you want to minimize the cost of coordination, which is, uh, is the easiest because it's already done. We, we got the blockchain, it's already done for us. So firstly, there, there are rules to play. So if there are rules to play, the meaning is that we don't need to struggle deciding about the rules all the time because there are rules to play. We just can play under rules. Then there are autonomous contracts to actually execute under those rules, which is great, and there are P2P networks to connect us all. So that's the easiest part. Well, actually, it's the hardest part, but it's the easiest because it's already done. Great. Okay, so this is the biggest conundrum, conundrum of central decision making, which is a fundamental tension. There is a fundamental tension in every decision making, decentralized decision making process. There is a fundamental tension between decentralization, resilience, and scalability. That also holds true for the blockchain itself. The blockchain is a decentralized decision making, very narrowed purpose, but is a decentralized decision making process, and it has a strong tension between decentralization, resilience, and scalability, and I'll show you the tension. I also, I also propose uh, means to basically work with that tension. And as, as you'll see, we, already, we are already familiar with those means under different names already in the blockchain. So what is the tension? It's very easy to understand. It's basically the tension of the natural limit on attention, uh, attention bandwidth. So when we say decentralization, intuitively, we mean that there are many, many evaluators. So each decision needs to have made. There are many evaluators that can decide about it. When you say resilience, we mean that large active percentage of evaluators is active per evaluation. And then with scalability means that we have many evaluations. So essentially when we say all that, what we mean is that roughly everyone attend everything. Right? But if everyone attend everything, we just got the bandwidth of an individual for a large organization. This is clearly inscalable. Okay? In fact, we get even le less than individual or roughly the same order, but less than individual, because at each decision will be as slow as the slowest, right? So it's even, even worse. This is, this is a fundamental tension. We cannot, um, we cannot, in a way, I mean, we, we cannot make it, um, we cannot, I would say, delete that tension. We somehow need to work with it, okay? So that's the main challenge. Okay, I will suggest some fundamental principle that I argue that it has to be in a system that resolves that tension. Okay? Three fundamental uh, principles. So one of them is monetization of attention. I will, I will get into more details. But that is to say that attention is scarce. If attention is scarce, it needs to be represented by a scarce element, thus token, monetization, coin, whatever, currency. So this is a fundamental truth, if you want, of reality. The second one is compositionality or complexity. So the more your, your, your system is complex, the more it can handle scalable, resilient decision making, and we'll show, we'll show details. And the third is the relative majority, uh, which I will get into much more details later. So let's start with monetization of tension. Um, it's, very, it's, it's the easiest to understand. Basically, you firstly get, for free, you get anti-spam and anti-misuse uh, mechanism. If it costs to take the attention of everyone, then you cannot overflow. Uh, and basically um, attack the system, like sort of DDoS attack the, the, the attention of the system. Um, so that's, that's, that's a very good bonus to begin with. Secondly, which is no less important, you can still promote something more when you need it. This is not very, it's not bad that you can, if you want to can purchase attention, collective attention. And that's not bad, I mean sometimes, sometimes the thing that I want is more important than something else that I just a little bit want but it's not critical. So there is flexibility to purchase, if you want, more of the collective attention of the organization. Thirdly, it gives a monetization model for the organization, which is great, right? An organization that doesn't have a monetization model cannot uh, go under growth and, and, and uh, sustainability, so it's good to have a monetization model. And finally, I just want to remind you that you're already familiar with that concept. This is just an analogous concept to gas in Ethereum, or, or if you want Bitcoin in Bitcoin. So basically, Ether is the gas to pay for the collective attention of computers in a computing, centralized computing network. In the same way, the, the native tokens of this system will be the gas 
to buy for collective attention. You, you can't buy the decision, otherwise it will be corruptible, but you can buy the attention. And as you see, you also need to stake something to be resilient. Okay, so compositionality. So firstly, what, what do I mean by compositionality? So I, I thought that it's better, instead of just formalizing, but just make a picture. So this is what I mean by compositionality. This is a non-composition system, or non-complex, and this is a composition system. So what is the effect of that? So first you can see that it pushes localized decisions to localized groups, right? So for example, if this is a fund management uh, system or insurance fund management system, then you can empower some of the decision into a smaller circle, right? It's basically equivalent to empowerment. And then smaller decisions, localized decision, can be taken by localized groups. So it's more, much more efficient. Secondly, which is no less important, you can see that even the global decisions that, that occur here or here are actually more efficient in this structure. So let's just make a quick test. How many individuals, let's say that are all equal, how many individuals need to agree here to form a decision, majority decision? Suggestion? So these are nine, nine individuals. So how many individuals need to agree about consensus about a decision? Five, Five correct. How many individuals need to agree here about the decision in order to form a decision over here? Assuming that these, these sub-companies are also agents, equal agents in a larger company. Four, exactly. So you see, we, not only we push local decision into local, uh, localized groups, we also increase the attention bandwidth of the higher uh, group as well. Now you may complain that we just hurt resilience because we can take over the system with less agents, but I would argue that we didn't because not every configuration of four people can take over the system. So if you actually put that back, back in, you can actually gain resilience in that, in that uh, structure, okay? Um, and again, this is not very unfamiliar to you if you heard the word sharding. So in a way, every resolution of the centralized decisionary system needs to have some sort of comple complexity or compositionality. And finally, and I think most excitingly, um, relative majority, which I'm still looking for a better name for that. Um, what do I mean by that? So firstly, what, what do I mean by relative majority? So that, again, let's take, take a picture. Let's assume these are reputation holders, okay? The empty balls are, th are those who just did not vote. The light balls, balls uh, voted, uh, uh, let's say, voted yes, and, and the uh, the dark uh, votes voted no. So clearly we don't have any majority of saying yes or no, right? There is no absolute majority in the system, but clearly we have a relative majority from those who voted that says no. So we can say, okay, there is a decision here. Uh, out of those who voted, there is a decision that says no, right? But it's not an absolute decision. It's not, it's not, it's not a decision taken from all of reputation holders, and that's where we enter the problem of resilience. But we would like to have a system that can act like that, okay? Now, the point is that to observe, and, we'll, and I'll get into much more detail, is that for truly having decentralization, scalability, and resilience, you actually don't need everyone to participate in everything. That's, that's by definition, inscalable. What you do need is that everyone can participate in the decision, and that there is high enough stake to bad act, and correspondingly, High, high enough gain to flag that act. If you have those two things together, you can have small groups making decisions still becoming decentralized, scalable, and resilient. And again, this is not very unfamiliar. If, you, if, you, if you're familiar with the logic of off-chain computation, it's the same idea. Some people can make the computation off the chain, they can just submit the answer. Now, clearly not everyone in the network needs to recompute everything, but everyone can recompute everything. And why should they? because there is high enough stake whenever you are submitting to the chain of chain computation, you're staking something, and if you are lying, you're losing that stake. And anyone can check that, and anyone will check, or some people will check that because they can gain that stake that you will lose. So the, 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 crit the critical point is that the openness rather than the inclusiveness. Okay? So let's, with that, let's take a concrete example. Let me see how I'm doing with time. Yeah, let's quit. So let's take a concrete example. I want to propose one simple, 
voting system, which is decentralized, resilient, and to some degree scalable. I will try to be as detailed as possible, not too, no, not too technical, but basically I will try to describe the entire protocol. Um, so there are four stages if you want. Oh, this slide actually was updated, so look at this, there are three stages. There, are, there is a proposal submission, there is the boosted proposals, and then the proposal queue. Okay, I just merged two bullets into one bullet. I like three more than four. So let's start with the proposal submissions. So basically, I want to, by that I want to say firstly, this is a proposal-based system. Not any decision system is a proposal-based system. Okay, you can also have actions triggered by non-proposal systems, but proposal is the simplest. So let's start with proposal-based systems. Uh, you submit a proposal, anyone can submit a proposal. Again, openness, anyone can submit a proposal. There is some minimal fee to play, so there is minimal submission fee. And the proposal is simple, it's basically yes or no. I'm, I'm proposing to do something, okay? Now what something do I propose to do? Basically anything, but let's just give some examples. For example, maybe I'm supposed to distribute tokens of my own, of this company, to the tokens of that company, okay? So it's kind of like the native equity, if you want, of that company, or na native asset of that company. So distribute tokens. Maybe you want to allocate funds, maybe that company owes some external funds, maybe Ether, so to allocate funds. Maybe you want to assign reputation, so voting power of that company to someone, to an agent. Maybe you want to propose to act collectively. I want to propose that this company, okay, as an entity on the blockchain, opens the prediction on Gnosis, okay? This, uh, this company can do that, and I want to propose that to a collective act. It can also be, I'm suggesting that this company will make a proposition or a vote on an existing proposition in another company. Okay, collective act. Then, of course, everything that I'm just saying right now is a protocol, so maybe I want to propose to change the protocol. And finally, everything eventually will need to be implemented on the blockchain, so maybe I want to propose to change that implementation. And finally, anything else. Basically, a good system will be able to, to act and do anything that can be done on the blockchain. And finally, votes are weighted by reputation. Again, we want to be meritocratic. Okay, so the booster proposal. So there is, there is this new class of proposals that I want to suggest, called the booster proposals. Basically, there is all, so the first property of them, that there is just finite number of booster proposals at any given time. Let's pick a number, let's say 10, okay? So at any given time, our organization can have up to 10 booster proposals. What is the meaning of boosted? So the meaning is that once you've boosted the proposal, there is a finite time in which decision can be occurred. Okay? So once boosted, there is a finite time decision period. Now at the end of that time, the decision will simply be a relative majority decision. So know that in any previous uh, trial for government system, there was a quorum. But quorum generally is a bad thing. So it's a bad thing because it can, all, it can only be either too high or too low. If it's too high, the system is completely unscalable. If it's too low, the system is completely inresilient. And, and likely, it's actually both in different times. Okay, so if at all you want to have quorum, remember, have dynamical quorum. But this is easier, there is just no quorum. You can take, you can take a decision with, any, with major, relative majority with any quorum. You, you, need, you don't need any quorum at all. And this is exactly what I mentioned by edge decision making. But now we need to protect, we need to make sure that this is a resilient system. And that is exactly because of the finiteness of the number of booster proposals at any given time. So the attention that can go to each of those proposals in the booster stack can, can be of everyone in, this, in the organization if desired so. So there is no quorum needed. And finally, just a small comment, if you're familiar with that, you, you won't be surprised. If not, I won't get into it, but basically, you have to have a quiet ending period, which means that, let's say, in the last day of the vote, no change in the majority from yes to no or vice versa has occurred. And if, it ch if, if a change did occur, then you postpone the ending in another day, and so on and so forth. So this is the stack of boost of proposals, and now the, the, there is the queue. So there is a queue of proposals, Anyone can vote on proposals already when they're in the queue. 
And if somehow majority of all reputation no, this kind is an absolute majority of all reputation holders approve that proposal, it is just executed. You don't, it doesn't need to go to the stack, to the boosted stack. However, note that every time that the stack is being vacant, which means one of the 10 proposals in the stack has been closed, one proposal from the queue goes to the stack. And which one? The one with the highest rank. So what is rank? Rank is a way to basically say, you know, what proposal is kind of more important, or if you want, we, what proposal do we want to give more attention to? That's really the question. So for example, one, one example for ranking system, you can have many, many ranking systems. One example is R plus square time P. R plus is basically the, R plus is the amount of reputation that already endorsed that proposal. So for example, if 10% of the reputation in the whole system has already endorsed that proposal, already in the Q stage, then R plus is just 0.1, okay? So we take R plus square, and then we multiply it with this number P, which is basically the promotion of that proposal. So anyone can at any time promote a proposal by just staking tokens on that proposal. So P is basically the stake that I put on a proposal. I know that the stake is returned, minus the posting fee, only if the proposal eventually becomes successful. And if the proposal is not successful, I lose my stake. Okay? So basically this, this simple protocol defines a fully decentralized, well potentially decentralized, resilient and scalable protocol. Uh, well, again, the tension is always there. So when I say scalable, it's always scalable to a degree. So in this case, the scalability of the, of the, of the protocol is bottlenecked by the number of boosted proposals at the time. If it's 10, that's exactly the bandwidth of the organization, but it can be higher than individual bandwidth. You can set it up. You can also dynamically change that number via proposal to change the protocol or to change that number. Okay, how can you push? I just want to show you that I won't get into much more details about that. You can implement this kind of, once you understand the principle of decentralized governance, you can implement many different implementations of this kind of, of system with the same principle. And then I just want to show you that you can push up scalability in many more tricks. So I'll just show you one trick. So one trick is to push up scalability will be the, technique, the same protocol, but now the, the boosted stack is a dynamic, dynamic number rather than rigid number. So this is just one scheme to make it dynamic. You can have up to five proposals with rank. The rank is that R plus square time P. So let's say that if you have, you can have five proposals that with rank less than 10. But if suddenly you have a lot of proposals with rank more than 10, you can have in total up to 10 proposals with rank smaller than 100. You have up to 15 proposals with ranks more than 1,000. You see this exponent, growing exponential here, linear here. And by that you can push up the bandwidth of the organization. You know, maybe suddenly there's many, many decisions which are ultra important. People are staking a lot on them. So then you, know, you can stress the attention of the organization a little bit more. Okay, so this is one way to do that. Finally, if you collect everything that I just said, if you just collect everything that I just said, you can now cook up a decentralized claim management system for insurance. I'll just briefly go over it and say that you, you, you basically organize in, in nested circles. Claims will be posted with a minimal stake and promoted with higher stake. Claim will be decided by a relative majority rather than absolute majority. Circle internal decisions will be processed inside the circle up to the internal level of coverage. And then if you cross that level, circles will need to request for external coverage for the, for the higher level circles. And then higher level circles, once get such a request, will need to curate the entire list of the lower level circle claim, but only when they go above their uh, internal coverage. And then they need to be posted with a higher stake and so on and so forth. Basically, you can just repeat all that. A stake, of course, is distributed to agreeing assessors and reputation, reputation of agreeing assessor goes up while reputation of misaligned assessor goes down. This describes a fully working system um, in, you know, in small details, but now you should be complaining or challenged saying that, well, firstly, we need now to implement all of that on the blockchain. That's a big deal. Secondly, we need to have a very heavy security challenge. Um, it requires constant evolution flexibility of the parameters of the system of the governance. 
and so of the code. It requires a network effect, and we would like also to have some interoperability with other system. So this is the problem right now, and luckily we got a solution for that. So what we're what we have been building in the past year, and basically in the past four years, if you take also a, a, in account previous attempt, is basically a DAO stack, a DAO stack, which is technology stack for any sort of grammar system, including that. Okay, so you can just take the already working DAO stack and just integrate it with your insurance application and get everything that just said out of the box. So I will be very, very brief because I'm almost ending the time. This is the kind of caricature of the architecture, the smart contract architecture of each and each agency. I call them agency. So each and each atomic unit of governance. Okay? So this is, this is a blockchain agency. This is the controller, which is basically the command and control. It owns the actors. This is the hands and legs and face of the, of the, of the agency. It owns the actors, so it's the only, only entity that can command on the actors, but it's then owned by the logics. Uh, these are the logics, these are the building blocks of governance. Basically, the governance is always dissolved into do's and don'ts. So these are the do's, the logical rules that says if this and that happens, then that and that, execute that and that. Whereas these are the don'ts, saying there are limitations. No matter what, don't do that. So any governance system can be decomposed into building blocks of do's and don'ts, and now we can generate a library, like this is like kind of like a WordPress for governance system. You can generate a, a growing open source library of do's and don'ts, and now you can, fix, you can say, okay, I want to make a governance system of these do's and these don'ts, and here you are, you have a governance system. And that's also, also solving the security problem because you don't need to recode every time you make a new government system, you only need to recode the whole thing, which will be insane, of course, security-wise, but you can all use battle-tested plugins, governance plugins, that have already been working in many other systems. Finally, these are the actors, what they can do. Basically, anything that I just mentioned before can be done with the systems, um, including changing the protocol, and the interface is here. All, all users interface with that system through the governance schemes, uh, which are here. Finally, design principle, modularity, it's highly modular. You can break things into very small chunks. Simplicity, uh, the, the whole system is fully upgradable, uh, fully interoperable with, with itself and with other systems. So a company can open an agent in another company, uh, or a company can open a company in Aragon as well. Um, openness, of course, is very crucial. And let me, let me leave like three minutes for questions and just ends here. You can see the whole code, back end, front end, uh, in here. Uh, the system is live, working, ha heavily tested. And uh, this is my email, and you're welcome, welcome to be, uh, be in touch. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Matan. Um, I'm, I'm impressed. My first question to you would be, we have insurance systems in place. We have licenses to put insurance systems on the blockchain. How can we get this implemented? How can we, how can we get there? Very, very pragmatic, very concrete. Yeah, very concrete. With, so why it's called DAO stack? Because we actually build stack of layers. I haven't put it in here. So this will be the, the first layer in the stack. We call it ARC, which is the framework for governance. It's, it's very general, very modular, already working. And then the second layer is called ArcJS. It's basically a JavaScript library that you can operate everything that we can offer. You can operate from JavaScript directly. And then there are collaborative apps going on top of JavaScript. We already have one. There are a few others that are already in process to integrate to that stack. So basically, you can take your application and then directly integrate to that system through JavaScript and basically operate everything that you said. If you are missing some element in the protocol that are not existing yet in the library, part of our service is that we are helping you figure out that protocol and, and implementing the missing elements. Thank you so much. I, th I think we have another uh, task on our to-do list, Christoph. So, I want to open up. We have a bit of time for questions. Um, who, wants, who wants to start with the first question? Oh, thank you. And we have another one. Uh, you mentioned Argon. Is that part of the stack? Argon? So Argon is a different, of course, project which is highly related. I'm just saying, I'm just trying to say that it's, this, this one is highly interoperable in the sense that it's so interoperable, modular, and universal that it can actually operate also with Argon and basically any other system. So Argon is not, is not part, not integral part of that stack. I'm just saying that this stack is 
interoperable with every other system, including Argon. Does that answer your question? Any more questions to Matan? Sure. Okay. If we have no more questions, then I would say we go to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Matan. Thank you very much.